Hey everybody, this is Jay Michaels and we are at phoenixfearcon.com, the virtual film festival and horror convention. And we're thrilled to be speaking today with Russell Rothberg. Russell Rothberg is the mastermind behind a lot of the fantasy films and horror series that, uh, that we know and love. Uh, and, and I'm thrilled because he's an old college buddy. And so I'm, I'm happy to hear I'm not, uh, I'm not the only one that delved into, into the macabre as we, uh, as we graduated. Uh, Russ, it's great to see you again. Oh, and you, you look marvelous. How's everything? Uh, thank you, Jay. Everything is great. Uh, you look fantastic yourself. I paid him. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, you're, you're out in California, and, and you told me that uh, uh, the, the sky is finally blue today. Yeah, the sky is finally blue. Ominous has finally moved out of our, uh, our sky, and the air quality is breathable. So big improvement for us. It's, it's small changes, low bar. Good. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. All right, so, so uh, uh, when, when we spoke on the phone some time ago, you told me, uh, you told me what, what had happened to you since we, we knew each other in college, and uh, I, was, I was utterly thrilled and quite inspired. Uh, give us, give us uh, the, the, the autobiography of, of Russell Rothberg. Great, I will give you the cliff notes of the autobiography. <laughs> um, so 700 years ago, when we both left college, Yes. Um, you know, I was kicking around in New York and doing off-Broadway and writing and directing a little bit and started getting involved in indie film, finally moved out to Los Angeles because somebody gave me great advice, which was, oh, you want to write? Why don't you try writing for television? It feels like there'd be more jobs. And I thought that was the most practical piece of advice I'd ever gotten because if you look at the end of a TV show, there's 12 writers listed. So I moved out to LA and I got a job as a writer's assistant on a show. It took me a while. You got to spend a lot of resume time. And this was before email was really big. It's about 22 years ago. So um, everything is being faxed and followed up on. And I started working on a show called Legacy on the UPN network to see how it was all done. So I was in the writer's room as the assistant. I wrote a script on spec, which means speculation. And uh, everybody told me not to do that, but I did. And my boss ended up buying it. So the last episode of that show that was actually shot because it got canceled was my episode. Uh, after that, I kicked around because nobody will arrest you once the show gets canceled. And, uh, you know, I attempt around and I kind of learned how the business worked and I learned how the executive side worked. And I thought, oh, I don't think people really have my background on this side of the business. So maybe I'd be good at this. So I started working for Lifetime, television for women. And uh, I got promoted and then I moved over to Fox where I worked on some great shows like House and 24, Bones, The Sarah Connor Chronicles. And um, from there, I went to NBC where we did the event, which was kind of our big show. We also did the Cape and five other new shows got on the air. And, uh, and after that, I moved over to Universal when they separated out the studio to run drama development for Universal Television. So once over there, we started developing things like uh, new Dick Wolf shows, the Chicago Fire series, uh, my personal favorite, Bates Motel. I know you love that show too. And, um, and since then, I've worked at a couple of other things, and now I'm independent freelance writer-producer. And in between there, you were uh, an executive VP at, Universal, at NBC Universal TV, yeah? Yes, I, was, uh, I, was, uh, I became the EVP of uh, drama development at Universal Television. Wow. So our job was basically developing new dramas for NBC, our sister network, but also for... Netflix and A&E at the time was doing original scripted. And I think we had a show on uh, Amazon. We were being looked at for shows on ABC and CBS. Now, now, now you're a humble guy because you're, you're making this, oh yeah, well, you know, I, I moved to California, you know, I had lunch <laughs> and then I was a VP and then I worked on this and then my show went to television. And went, you're, you're being very humble on that. What, what obstacles did you face? What, uh, uh, um, as you look back, what, when, when did you sigh and say, oh, this is tough? Um, I sighed on the plane on my way out to Los Angeles. Um, you know what? It's, uh, we didn't come out with a lot of money. Like, we didn't have any money. We were theater people. You know, my wife's an ex-dancer and choreographer. And um, so we came out with kind of a very limited amount of funds. And when we got here, it was raining. And we thought it never rains in Southern California. Isn't that what the song says? 
And it was an El Nino system, which means that it rained constantly for the first month and a half we were here. Oh, man. And it was Vera and I, a blow up mattress and our cats on a blanket in an apartment with no furniture. That's just circumstances that change over time. I would say the hardest part was it's really hard to get a job in this industry. And it's really hard to get a job as a writer's assistant. You know, it's hard enough to get a job as a writer, but getting a job even as a writer's assistant is pretty hard. And um, at one point I was looking through the newspaper for jobs because just to work and make money while I was chasing my dream. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I applied for this job, which was a sales job. And I took my one really bad suit out of the closet and it was like baggy and terrible and I had had it for 10 years because I never wore a suit. And I went to this job interview and it was in some industrial park and deep in the valley where it was 195 degrees. And I'm sitting in a circle with a bunch of, I'm saying kids because at the time I was 34 and they were all kind of 20. And the guy kind of makes this announcement to the group about how it works. And then he asks me and this other guy to stay. And he says, I think you two guys have it and we could train you and you basically sell this stuff. And, and I, I get out and I walk back to my car and I call my wife on my cell phone, which looked like an army phone back then. This is 20 years ago. Right? And she said, how did it go? And I said, well, they want to train me and have me do it but I feel like if I do it, I'm basically gonna be throwing my soul out the window. And I'm never gonna be chasing my dream because I'm gonna be doing this. And my wife, to her unbelievable credit, said, forget that, come home, you're not doing that. And after that, I followed, so that was a low moment, walking back to your car and feeling like, I'm gonna, there's nothing wrong with doing sales if that's what you're setting out to do or just to make money, but, but um. It just felt like, oh, this is really me getting completely away from why I moved here. So that was kind of a low point of thinking like, I have to do this to survive, but at the same time, how do I keep the dream alive? And the answer is a lot of us did it back when we were in our acting days, just like you, Jay. And you basically worked as a waiter or you worked as anything else you could to make money while you're chasing your dream. So it wasn't that different here. I mean, I'm lucky enough that I can say once I started working professionally, I don't think I made any decisions based on money. I made decisions based on things that I wanted to do. So, Great. yeah, you get, I mean, I got lucky in that way. You know, it's, it's kind of like my father used to say, uh, hey, look at you. You know, you, it, you work hard every day of your life for 20 years to be an overnight success. And that's kind of how it is in the industry. Like you bust, it is 98% perspiration. It really is. And then you get to the point where all of a sudden, if the door is open that much, you can put your foot in because you've done the work. My, my, my father worked as a salesman uh, and uh, he, he had uh, basically the same comment. He said, whatever you need to do to get your foot in the door, do it, whatever it takes, but you better have the chops when you get there. So, so you, you obviously have the chops. Uh, or, or, or I'm really good, or the acting uh, did me justice later on when I faked my way through. There you go. Uh, uh, and I remember you to be an excellent actor and an excellent writer. And, and let's, let's move into the genre. It's funny, when you had said to me about uh, uh, that you're working, uh, that you, you've dealt in a lot of genre work, uh, I thought for a minute, I didn't know. And then I realized, yes, I did. You, you wrote some amazing works, and they all were quite macabre. I remember uh, you did one play which went off Broadway to Theater Row, and it, uh, it took place in a graveyard and, and all of that. So, so that was always there. Now, you ha you've, you've done a lot of work in this industry, uh, and when that, I mean, I say the, the horror sci-fi fantasy industry. One big one, you mentioned the Bates Motel. You helped develop the Bates Motel. How'd that go? Wow. Give, give us some adventures from, uh, from that. Bates Motel, sure. Um, uh, well, okay, so first of all, it really came to us, we were at Universal. I was running drama development under Bella Bajaria, who was running the whole studio. And uh, a colleague of ours that we both knew from A&E Network uh, came to us and said, hey, we've read this script that we really like. It was a two hour, I don't know if it was supposed to be a pilot and maybe it was supposed to be a backdoor pilot, meaning that then it would become a series. Mm -hmm. And uh, we really love it, but it's in the world of Psycho and you guys did Psycho. So would you do this for us? So we read the script and we said, and it was, it was pretty nicely written by Anthony Soprano, um, Cipriano. And, um, 
we said, no, we can't do this because it was very small and very dated and we really needed somebody who was gonna open up the world and somehow make it feel like it has a contemporary relevance, even though it's obviously something that was gonna happen before the events of Psycho. Right. So uh, we knew that we needed somebody who was a really big name and kind of had a lot of credibility in the industry because A&E needed that. They hadn't done scripted series before. It was kind of their first one. Maybe they'd taken one or two forays that didn't work, but this was kind of their big shot. So uh, I called the agencies and I said, what about Carlton Cuse? And I've been trying to work with Carlton for a long time. And for, for anybody who doesn't know, Carlton was the showrunner um, who basically worked with Damon Lindelof to make Lost what it was. And, and a thousand other shows, um, The Strain, uh, Jack Ryan. I mean, these are all Carlton Q shows. He's just, he's phenomenal. And um, we meet, this is actually a fun story. We meet for a coffee to talk about it a little bit. And we start to just bond because you're in Hollywood. You first you have a drink and you kind of talk and schmooze and learn about each other. Then you get to the business. And I, we were talking and the way he started to talk about Bates Motel and the prequel, he thought, I want to do it today. Even though it's a prequel, it doesn't matter. I want to do it today. But with a little bit of a vibe and tone that's true to the movie. And I said, oh, that sounds cool. And then he started talking about expanding the world and maybe having this whole drug dealing element of the pot they were growing up there and a brother and all this other kind of stuff. And I thought, wow, the way you're talking about this is the way I look at my favorite horror books, like Stephen King. A Stephen King novel, yes, it's got a high concept in the middle of it, but it's always about those smaller characters that are in the town that are kind of scarier than the monster. And Carlton said, oh, that's funny you say that because uh, the big inspiration for Lost was The Stand. And we're just bonding over this. And then he tells me that he actually watched a horror movie with Stephen King in a theater, which I thought was the best story I'd ever heard in my life. Um, me having a meeting, a serious meeting with a serious producer about stuff. And I probably looked like this, <laughs> you know, Stephen King. Um, so Carlton comes on board, which was great. And he wanted to work with another writer as a partner because he has a lot of projects going on. And while he was looking for writers and whatnot, I was meeting with Carrie Aaron. Now, Carrie Aaron was a writer that I had to deal with because she worked on Friday Night Lights and Parenthood. And um, I inherited that deal and then re-upped it because she's amazing. She's one of the best pure writers I know. Right now she runs and writes the morning show for Apple. And I met with Carrie and she was just pitching me some ideas she wanted to develop. And I was like, okay, those are all right. And it started to hit me, she's the perfect person to do this with Carlton because he sort of has the high concept of the, oh, the drug thing in the town and the prequel, but contemporary. She has the character work. And I can arguably say that I think Carrie Aaron wrote the part of Norma Bates better than any other female character I've seen on television in a decade. And um, put them together, they kind of, it was love at first sight professionally. And they worked on Bates Motel to start with together. And I have other deals with other writers. So I put my best writers on that show. And um, it was really successful creatively. It was pretty successful for the network too. And now that it was on Netflix, it became even more successful for Netflix. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, it's, it's really interesting you say that because Norma Bates doesn't exist when you really get down to it. If you're just looking at the movie, she's a skeleton in the last few minutes of the movie and, and so to create this role is incredible uh, pardon me pardon me if i'm 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 naive was the name norma bates used anywhere in in the original piece or or was this a creation for bates motel um you know that's an excellent question i don't because you only hear him ever say mother right so, um i don't think it's used in the movie it might be used in one of the subsequent movies, which none of us really watched, or maybe watched the second one. It was like, oh, Anthony Perkins, but why? It's a classic. Don't mess with it. Yeah, thank you. But um, no, I don't, think that, I don't think the name Norma was used in the movies. And I thought Norma and Norman was kind of so perfect. But Gorgeous. That's why I asked. It's like, Norma, of course. Yeah. Of and course. the character, and I have to commend them both and carry in a big, big way, because the way most people would think about doing Norma Bates is 
she's an overbearing, crazy, psychotic mother that creates a crazy, psychotic kid. Right. And instead, she was somebody who's a really complicated character. And if you watch the show, you get it. She loves her son. She'll do anything for her son. It's not about her being crazy. They have a weird relationship. Some people would ask me, is their relationship sexual? Because they're so in each other's face all the time. Right. And I said, no, it's not. It's not sexual. And I'll quote Karen Aaron on this because I had said to her once, um, talking about this issue, and she said, yeah, their relationship isn't intimate in that way, but it's really inappropriate because the mother kind of treats the son almost like a partner, you know? So I thought that was a really good way to describe it. It's an inappropriate relationship and an odd dysfunctional relationship, but there is nothing sexual crazy about it. You, you did something very interesting and I'm wondering if, uh, what, what year did Bates Motel start? When did you start developing Bates Motel? That's an excellent question that I can't answer. I don't remember. I would say I would say it had to be ten years ago. Hmm. Uh, you may you may have been one of the the trendsetters on this because this is something that's done a great deal. If you look at Gotham, uh, they also it's 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 the Batman legend. But you get the idea. Okay, is it the past? Is it now? When is it exactly? It's this this nebulous world and and uh, in in the world of comic books of which I I car I'm a card carrying geek. Uh, you see all the time rebooting of these legends so that there's always, there's always a contemporary Batman, always a contemporary Spider-Man or Superman. So you may have been a trendsetter in terms of this parabolizing uh, uh, the great lore of something. Now, now there's something interesting. Uh, you, uh, in, in terms of writing this, in terms of developing it, uh, you dealt with an amazing... It, it's, it's said to be one of the definitive horror films, and needless to say, it was an Alfred Hitchcock movie. Uh, did you, how, what did you have to do in terms of keeping the lore? Uh, did you have situations of, of people saying, no, you can't do that because this character would do this, or Robert Block wrote it this way? How did you, how did you create a, a, a joining history with, uh, with the film? It's, it's a good question. How did we create this? Um, how do you stay true to something that already exists, but then make it creatively new and fresh and all your own. And I think the way they did it was they kind of always had a plan that the end of the TV show would sort of be the beginning of the movie. Right, right. So they were really leading up to those events. So once you have your motel <laughs> and you have Norman and Norma and, um, I would say something about the last season, but just in case anybody's watching this and hasn't seen the show, I'm gonna hold off on the spoiler. Thank you. Uh, but um, the way it leads up is really inventive because it kind of tells both sides of the story. And tonally, we really wanted to keep it in the psycho tone. So one of the big things that, that came about for that was before that, in terms of Norman has a girlfriend, Norman has an iPod, Norman, you know, all of that stuff is just liberty, obviously, that you're taking away to make it contemporary. But I think Freddie Highmore, who was fantastic playing Norma Bates, Norman Bates, and uh, Vera Farmiga, who I think was stunning playing Norma Bates. You're so commanding. Uh, I, I, it's, it's funny you say that, and that's why I, I, I latched onto the name on that level. She, what she created was really perfect, and it blended right into the, the, the psycho we know. So yeah. I, was, I was really impressed with both of them. Yeah, I just liked how she was really unpredictable. And she would do things that you'd be like, oh shit, she's a little crazy, but not like you're psychotic. Sometimes you might feel that, but most of the time I think you feel she's a single mom who's kind of under the gun and has doing what she's had to do to make her way and has this dream of the motel that then gets screwed almost right away and she has to compensate. And in the middle of all this, she has a son with challenges. So for us, it was all about Tonally, keep it the tone of the show, of the movie. It's not just a horror thing, obviously. It's got right. a lot of deep character stuff because if you're doing 50 episodes, you can't just blow it out in two hours. No. And um, the other thing was finding the right director because you don't want somebody who's going to mimic Hitchcock. And we weren't going to do it black and white. And Carlton had it in his head that he always wanted Tucker Gates to do the first episode. And Tucker Gates, very accomplished director, has done a lot of stuff in Hollywood. And 
I met with Tucker and he came in with lookbooks, which is not atypical for a director to say, oh, this is how I would shoot it. I can honestly say everything he showed me in the lookbook was fantastic and he achieved it. It looked exactly like the show. So it was kind of a kismet of a perfect storm of Carlton, Carrie, Tucker, and actors that were fantastic. It was the best table read. The table reads when you basically have your script and the actors read it and the executives watch. And it was the best table read I've ever seen in my life. Oh, it's great. Uh, one more serious question on this one, and then I'm going to dissolve into fanboy for a couple of questions. <laughs> great. Uh, we're, we're in a very different world now. Uh, and, and so in 1960, to talk about someone who is mentally ill, as, as one surmises, uh, is one thing. Uh, and even 10 years ago, you can, you can, life was a bit different, but uh, how did you tackle the notion that you're dealing with a character? Okay, it's, not, it, it's a horror movie, but not a horror movie. Uh, how did you deal with a, with a character who has mental illness? Yeah, it's a, that's, a, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know that the writers ever approached it like, okay, he's mentally ill, let's go. I think they really wanted to approach it like, he's an odd boy who's trying to fit in. He's an odd boy who would like a girlfriend. He's an odd boy that's super close to his mom and it's a really weird dysfunctional relationship, but at times it works and it's beautiful. I mean, when they stand together at the piano and sing Sandman or whatever they're singing, yeah. it's like, it's so perfect. It's just so perfect. So I don't think we treated him like somebody, we're writing a story about somebody who's mentally ill. I think they always approached it from the point of view of, we're telling a story about a boy and his mother. And it just happens to be this boy and this mother. And, and let the events of his life, where he's a little odd to begin with, and I don't know if you remember how it starts again, I won't spoil even the first episode for you guys. But um, it starts in a way where he's put into a position that affects him for the rest of his life. So it's really interesting watching somebody devolve into their mental illness, but they're not acknowledging it and neither is their mother. Like the mother knows there's something up. She knows Norman's got challenges, but she's really just trying to do anything she can to make her son safe. Wow. So it's a mother who will do anything for her son. And that's the whole approach to the show. I'm, I'm always thrilled when I hear that there's a foundation of, uh, um, of reality, of uh, intellectual uh, uh, concept, of of adherence even to spirituality when you get right down to it for, for horror movies. Because I've I've always felt they're all called, uh, cautionary tales. If we if we if we just watched Contagion a few yeah. years <laughs> earlier, maybe we'd all be together uh, in person, whatever. But um, uh, so for you to talk about this, this is really the story of every man. This is this is. This is a woman who just is trying to keep her son safe. And maybe yeah. he's totally fine, but, but the forces around him are just, are just chipping away at him. So you've, you've handed us a very strong tragedy. You've handed us a Greek tragedy in, in, yeah, in you know, it's, weekly it's, episodes. I guess it is. I guess it is kind of a tragedy because it's weird. No matter what heinous things happen, you're kind of always rooting for Norma and Norman throughout the whole series. Yes. So, and, and that's, frankly, that's the best TV shows in the world make you do that. The Sopranos. Didn't you root for Tony Soprano? Of course. Of in course. the first episode, even, he runs a guy down with a car. He's a heinous guy. He's a really heinous guy. You can't help but root for him. Breaking Bad, Walter White, you can't help but root for him. He does heinous things. So when you have great writers, what they could do is just imbue the character with so much humanity that you have empathy, sympathy, and you could put yourself in their place, even if they're doing heinous things. I've, I've always been uh, 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 morbidly impressed with how the, the, the monster or the villain seems to be more popular than the <laughs> hero. Every, everyone, everyone can't wait for Darth Vader to step onto the screen. Yeah. Uh, there are stories of Bela Lugosi receiving mountains of, of fan mail from women writing him love letters. Right. And, and there is even, I read uh, a, 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 a dossier once about, uh, about Freddy Krueger and how during the movies, the original movies, his, uh, his glove and hat and mask were the leading costume amongst young children for Halloween. <laughs> and I thought, oh, how great. A child molester who eviscerates his victims is the leading costume 
it, it always amazes me how, how something taps into our psyche and we're actually able to, to say, I, I'm rooting for that character. It, it, make, it makes you wonder what we all think of ourselves sometimes. Well, it's, it's true. It's like, well, you've been trained in horror movies, basically, or over a period of time. Maybe things are a little bit different now, that any teens that have sex deserve to get killed by a serial killer. Thank you. And the Thank one you. who doesn't have sex is the kind of petite blonde girl that you're going to root for in the entire movie. And that's the only one that you're hoping gets out and hoping defeats the guy. But there's a reason that there's, you know, 14 Halloween movies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. It's a, it's a particular parable. We're we're always hearing this this parable over and over again, and this is this is the way we want to hear it. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm dissolving into fanboy. So uh, <laughs> you you sat at a table with these amazing performers. You're all there. The, this this talented group, all of you. And uh, how did it feel to do? Uh, and I know we're calling it Bates Motel, but but for the sake of this question, how did it feel to do Psycho? To take something so legendary and say. I'm now part of Psycho. How is, how is the vibe within the, within the room and within filming in terms of being part of this, this legend? I think, I think the vibe on everybody's part was pretty outstanding. I think everybody was really excited about the idea of not just that we were part of Psycho, but that by the time we started shooting it, we had six episodes written. So we saw how it laid out and we saw how special this was. And now it's just a point of, oh my God, are those words gonna come to life? And Carlton said this at the table read actually, he said, this is the first time in my life that I've ever gotten my first choice on every cast member. And that's what it felt like. And you were sitting there, I'll paint a picture for you. We're sitting in some crappy little room in a Vancouver hotel or something. And um, it's being video, uh, videos streamed to, um, the NBC and a a and &E, or the Universal and A&E offices for the executives who aren't there live because we shot in Toronto, in uh, Vancouver. And so I'm in Vancouver in some shitty little room and here's this cast that just fold out tables and the camera shooting them is behind me. I'm sitting with my counterpart from the network, Tana Jameson, an amazing executive uh, and a very good friend. And we're sitting back and usually when people go to a table read, everybody has a script, you could follow along, you take notes, you do whatever you're gonna do. But um, something about it made me not even wanna pick up a script. And I just sat back on the couch and Tana had her script out for the first act and then threw her script away. And we both sat there like fans, you say fanboy, we both sat there like fans watching this table read because it was phenomenal. And part of what made it phenomenal is when you have a cast like that, it's mostly young, young actors. Freddie Highmore was, I think, 19 or 20. Right, right. And one of those guys that's going to Oxford and finishing next year and studying five languages and really brilliant and great guy, really super great guy. And um, you have Vera Farmiga as the head of your cast. And she was nominated for an Oscar two years before and up in the air or whenever that was. And one of the best actresses around, I think. And she sets the tone. So she and Freddie instantly had charisma together. And I think we immediately felt like, wow, we're in the middle of something really special here. Like, I believe Norma and Norman. I believe their relationship. I believe those characters. And Vera Farmiga, even when she wasn't in a scene, she would basically watch the other actors like she was in character watching that scene. So she kind of set this professional tone and took so much time with moments that you knew like you'd never just record that and put it on because for a minute her and Freddie are staring at each other in the room back home. They're like, why was she taking so long? What was going on? But in the room, it was obvious that this was serious charisma building. This was a serious moment. This was something you don't interrupt. And so you feel like you're peeking in more than you're kind of sitting there at a table read. Um, so I think everybody got really excited after that table read in particular, seeing the first six scripts and knowing how good they were, and then being at that table read and seeing how everybody connected and everybody was going to bring their own little special sauce to this. I think everybody got super excited. Oh, that's and then, and then there's the beauty of it's Bates Motel. So the most iconic thing about Bates Motel is the house, right? The house on the hill. That was going to be my second fanboy question. <laughs> So, I mean, everybody's seen the one in pictures and things that's on the universal backlot. 
uh, where they shot Psycho. And we basically recreated that house um, on a completely empty lot in Vancouver. And we recreated the house and the motel and we built the motel so that it would have at least two working rooms in addition to the office so that we didn't always have to be inside a studio stage to shoot stuff. We could shoot practically at the motel. And it was in such a kind of far off place that we literally had to build a road and a driveway and a road by it so that we could shoot like there's access to this house and motel. And um, it just added, the second you saw the, ho the, ho the hotel, the motel in the house, you felt like you were in psycho. There was no way around it. You're standing there going, wow, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. So, so you, you, you rebuilt this house, the, the facade and everything. So, so uh, tell me that picture, that, picture that, that we use for publicity of you standing there next to the Bates Motel. <laughs> that's a new Bates Motel. That's, that's the Vancouver Bates Motel. Actually, that one, when I took the picture, was for an article and written by magazine. So I was actually posed by the Universal Backlot Bates yeah. Motel. Okay. And I actually have a funny picture that didn't make the magazine where I'm inside the motel room. And it's just cropped like this. So you don't really see what's near me, but there's a dead body in a shower curtain right next to me. It's, it just felt odd and amazing being inside Bates Motel. Phoenix Fearcon's using that picture also. And whenever, whenever I show that, pub that publicity shot to someone, I say, did you know that there's a dead body right <laughs> in that picture? And they go, oh, and suddenly it's, it's, it's quite amazing. Oh, yeah. that must be amazing to see that, that, that motel again, to see the, the house and everything. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's history right there. The, the designer built the house, and I mean, it looks exactly like the house from, from the movie. Um, but he also built the interior, um, I guess, hallway, so that when you walk in the front door, we could play that actual and run down to the motel if we wanted to. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and the hallway of, of, of the house itself, where you see the famed staircase and all of that. The staircase, I think the bottom of the staircase we built there practically, but most of that staircase and the bedrooms and the dining room, and the other things you see were all on stage. That's great. But again, Tucker Gates lighting it and shooting it in a way that it just feels all of one piece and feels like it belongs to the movie. It all looked like it simply belonged there. And, and speaking of belonging, the way you're talking, it sounds like we're taking Psycho, we're taking the Bates Motel and it fits so naturally together. Um, uh, was that the majority rule? You, whenever you deal in something that has a, a fan base, when it, it has, has lore to it, you're always going to get fans who say, well, no, you know, it can't be that way because, you know, the character, did, did you get, did you get uh, uh, the, the negative mail saying, no, it can't be this way because Norman Bates is this? Did you get ardent fans to, 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 to battle you on your decisions? That's funny. We, we actually, that always happens and you kind of expect it. And anytime you're dealing with anything, I mean, J.J. Abrams remade basically the first Star Wars movie as his latest first one of the last trilogy. It's sort of the same movie. Um, and that's okay in this case, because you're resetting and you're giving the fans something familiar that's in their lore and in their wheelhouse, but you're introducing new characters. Um, in our case, we got a few people which we knew would happen, which were saying, leave Psycho alone, don't touch it, Universal screwing everything up. Uh, but I would say overwhelmingly, the fan response we got was pretty tight. That's what I figured. Yeah, That's what I figured. I'm I'm used to it in the comic book world. There's always somebody who says the movie is no. That's not how Black Widow should be played. And right. I'm sorry, don't you know the Captain America? Blah blah blah. So so I'm, 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 I'm happy. Right. Yeah. I'm 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 happy to hear you. Uh, uh, you the majority was uh, was the success of it. Uh, speaking of success, after that you had uh, you had several other projects that uh, that did really well. We we spoke of Nightfall at one point, uh, and and you were far more uh, hands on in terms of that. What what happened for you after Bates Motel? After Bates Motel, well, we developed a lot of stuff at Universal. I think the last big show we did at Universal that I loved, that I think didn't quite get its fair shot, was Emerald City, which mm. was kind of a big fantasy version of the Wizard of Oz story. The way we pitched it to the network when the writer first came up with it was it's Game of Thrones in the world of Oz. And, um, and it was, and there were a lot of updates we made to it that I think really added to people who are purists of the Wizard of Oz are not gonna watch it anyway. Yeah. You know? 
And you want to be true to the Frank Baum books because there's 14 books. A lot of people don't know that. It's not just one book. It's 14 books that all take place in Oz. And uh, I think we were taking the best things out of the book, making them somehow feel contemporary and um, casting a lead that was basically an early 20s uh, Hispanic woman as Dorothy who was studying to be a nurse. And, you know, we just kind of, made it a little more contemporary and aged it up a little bit. And um, that was exciting because we wrote all 10 episodes first and then we shot them with one director, which is rare that one director is gonna do all 10 episodes. Wow. And it was Tarsem who also directed, um, what was his last one? I forget his last one, but he did that Jennifer The Cell, the Jennifer uh, Lopez movie, Vincent D'Onofrio, who was also in Emerald City. Um, and Tarsem was great, and we shot a lot of it across southern Spain, and and um, no lighting, just natural lighting. We shot during the day, we shot day for night, and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, that was one of my favorites because it was just a really inventive way to get back into a story again that you know so well because everybody's seen The Wizard of Oz. But now, how do you take that mythology and lore and make it your own while still being true to the fact that it's about somebody being taken away from home and wanting to get back home? Interesting. So, so it's, it's about the parable in that case, more than, more than just the story. Yeah, totally agree. It was really, that's, we, we reminded ourselves of that. Um, every time we saw a script, it was basically like, is Dorothy's drive to get home being somehow moved forward? Because that's, she missed her family. She wanted to go home, but she also needed to come into her own and become the hero of her own story. And I think we gave her a great season where she could do that. I have so, a feeling that's going to become a cult classic because uh, as, as we grow as a society, as we look more upon uh, family, if we look more upon the, uh, the role of individuals in, in the world, I think people are going to look back on that series and say it's way ahead of its time. And so yeah, I, I, think, I think you're right. I think if it had been, frankly, no offense to NBC, but I think if it had been on... Um, a, a serious cable platform or a streaming platform where you could kind of just do more and not get interrupted by commercials. Uh, I think Emerald City would have been, it was really built more for cable. It was sort of a pre-Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones in a way. Well, it wasn't pre-Game of Thrones, but you know, it's that kind of a thing. That's the world we wanted to live in. But there's only so much you could do on regular broadcast television. Of course. Uh, and, and also there's a motif you get when you think uh, 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 broadcast TV, when you think network TV, you think one head frame. When you think uh, cable TV, you think another, so people's minds almost open up. Uh, what do you want? I'm, I'm on this channel. Oh, okay, what do you want? I'm on this station. Oh, okay, that's a different yeah. sort of situation. Um, you were in the middle of shooting something uh, when, when we all decided that we wanted to do a sleepover and stay indoors? <laughs> when the zombie apocalypse happened? With the, when the zombie apocalypse happened, you were in the middle of something. What, uh, and, and it's starting again, I'm thrilled to hear, uh, this fall. What, do you, what were you doing? Yes, I was, I was uh, overseas producing Foundation based on the famous Isaac Asimov books um, for Apple, for Apple TV. And we got through about, it's, it's going to be a big, gorgeous show. It's, 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 they're putting a lot behind it. There's a lot of money being put into the show. The special effects are going to be great. Our VFX guy is fantastic. And it's more and bigger sets than I've ever seen built for a television show. And I heard that from one person who visited my set who had directed Game of Thrones. So wow. Game of Thrones had big locations and we did too. We shot in Iceland, Germany, Ireland. Um, it's probably going to finish in um, Ireland, Malta and the Canary Islands. So it's got a big gigantic thing. Things look like other planets. Go to the middle of Iceland. It looks like another planet. You're on Mars. It's all lava fields, very rough terrain, but worth it because it's gorgeous. That's great. So that's, so we were shooting that. We got about, I don't know, maybe about almost halfway done. And uh, I was lucky I was already back here visiting back home because it was my wife's birthday in March. And on March 12th, everything shut down. So I think they're planning to go back in mid-October to finish the season, probably be on the air and, and on Apple TV in 2021, I guess. Apple TV. Okay, great. And, and you're flying back out and you're, you're going to be part of it whenever... I, I, am actually, I am actually not because um, shooting protocols right now, the way things are getting re shot now is people are quarantining together. 
especially if you're in another country. Mm -hmm. so if I went back to Ireland, I would spend four or five months in Ireland, Malta, Canaries, and not be able to see my wife live. <laughs> we would only have FaceTime because to come visit, you have to quarantine for 10 days. And then to come back, you have to quarantine for 10 days. So to go anywhere for a week is a month. Yeah. So it just felt a little undoable at the moment in the current circumstances. I love my wife, so I don't really want to be away that much. I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll end up being a part of it somewhere along the lines. Once, uh, uh, once, once the only masks we have to wear are Halloween masks. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. exactly. Uh, now, speaking of your wife, let's, let's segue just slightly out of, uh, of the genre. Uh, there's a documentary brewing over there in uh, the Rothberg home uh, with her name on it. Uh, tell us about that. There is. We produced it together. My wife directed it. It's a short documentary. It's a one hour documentary. And it's really about her, her sister and her mother. And her mother's dream of being a professional dancer in Paris in the 40s was upended by the war. And she swore that one day if she had daughters, they would dance. And both my wife and her sister have had very different but professional dance careers. And this documentary is really about these three women, a mother and two daughters, getting together, talking about the emotional resonance of dance and the dreams of the past unfulfilled and what that did to everyone's life. And I think it's really uplifting. And at the end, you see these three women really love each other. So, you know, families come through conflict in many different ways, but at the end of the day, they can still be family. So that's the documentary. And right now we just finished a fine cut and it looks beautiful. It's very emotional and hoping to get some uh, distribution going. That's terrific. Yeah, that's perfect. Please, please keep in touch and let me know what's what's going on with that. I, I see that that everyone in that family jumps on on the prevalent trends because the notion of family, once again, the notion of of living your dream and, and all of that is 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 becoming that much more potent. Uh, uh, so so I could see that documentary hitting a lot of a lot of strong chords. Oh, thank you from your lips. Um, it's also, it's what's going on in our world today. It's funny, you started out by saying, I think horror basically reflects what's going on in the world and current issues and things. And you and I had talked about this before. Get Out is kind of the best example of the last few years. Yeah. Because that just took something that right now, it was ahead of our current protest stage, even though obviously civil rights protests have been going on for, for more than even just the last 60 years. And uh, I think at its best, every story reflects something real that's happening in the world to people, real character issues. You could take, when I used to hear pitches of high concept ideas, people would come in and say, okay, so then there's a giant ship that comes or you know, there's no power anymore or there's no water anymore. And I would inevitably ask those people, that's great, play a game with me for a moment. Take away your high concept, what's your show about? And the, the real people who had real chops would immediately say, it's about this family and this father-son relationship and can the son ever measure up to the father? And you know, they'd immediately go to the characters because that's really what the show's about. So anytime you have your high concept or your, you know, it's following you. Whoa, that's okay. It's called, it follows. The thing is following you. You don't know what it is. It's really about the people and how they act and how they act with each other and that they're ready to pass on hard to somebody else just to get out of it themselves. So it's a comment on society, as you said in the beginning, right. rather than just be like, oh, it's a cool, weird gimmick that somebody's following. You know, and I think the best horror and the best entertainment of any kind do that. I mean, even Marvel movies, which feel like, oh, it's the comic book and it's just the superheroes doing their thing. No, I think these last bunch of movies has really gotten it right because they've given all of those characters that comic book fans are, are familiar with and fanatical about and just made them more human and made them more real. Uh, there's there's a, a book that basically compares the biblical parables to superheroes and and they they look at what was they look at both the the Judeo and Christian philosophies behind Superman and and the martyrdom if you will of Iron Man so so yeah it, it, take away the suit and all the special effects and and we're looking at something that's thousands of years old. Yeah when you get right down to it. Who, who was it? Was it somebody said there are no new stories? Shakespeare did them all? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And we've been copying those, whoever Shakespeare is, we've been copying those for, for, for decade upon century. 
Yeah. Uh, there's there's a, an interview with George Romero years ago where after he did Night of the Living Dead, which he did for like a dollar and a half in Philadelphia or something, uh, someone had said, oh, it's the parable of how our fears are coming to get us. And then, of course, there's this this racism quality within it and whatever. And, and when he first heard this, he was like, oh, OK, I was making a zombie movie. So, <laughs> OK, that's great. Uh, so but, uh, or at the same time, he had the foresight to cast a black man as the lead of that right. movie. Right. So and he, could say, he could say that, but at the same time, he knew what he was doing. You know, thank you. I, I, I always thought he was being overly humble or comedic when he'd say, hey, it was the best guy for the job. I'm yeah. sure somewhere even back here, he said, you know, I bet that's going to, to resonate with people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Russ, it's a pleasure to speak to you. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy for you. I'm so proud of you. Uh, uh, way back when, when we both had darker hair, uh, 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 you were one of the most ambitious. Uh, you were one of the most charismatic. So it's it's a pleasure to see that that you're succeeding, that you're out there and 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 doing what you love. I'm I'm thrilled to hear that Vera is is also achieving her own success, and it is a great pleasure to speak to you. And 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 here's to many more. Well, thank you, Jay. The feeling is quite mutual. It's great seeing you after all this time. And I have a feeling with our mutual love of uh, all things horrorful, we're going to have lots of fearful conversations in the future. I'm going to use that exact sentence, horrible and fearful. In that <laughs> Same thing right there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to email questions to Russell Rothberg about Bates Motel and about, about uh, wandering through the haunted house that is known as Hollywood and the, the uh, film industry, uh, please send your questions to jmcomnet at gmail.com. That's J-M-C-O-M-M-N et at gmail.com and since the phoenix fearcon virtual film festival runs till december 31 of this year there will be opportunities that i can send the questions to russ and he can answer them and we will send you the answer and we will also circulate those answers on social media so if you have a question for this brilliant soul i am sure he'd be more than happy to to answer it and 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 help you in your in your particular careers uh, Russ, thanks again. Thank you all. This is Jay Michaels for FearCon, phoenixfearcon.com.